Uh, so first quick round of applause for Dr. Uh, she is a postdoctoral research at UBCO and at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. A lot of her research focuses on uh, the galactic uh, I, uh, magnetic ionic uh, stuff. And, the stuff. and um, <laughs> yeah, and I think we'll just hand it over to Anna to start the talk. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, hang on, let me try to find this. How do I do that? I get your mouth. Well, maybe not. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much for the, the invitation to, to speak here today. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming. This is an amazing turnout. It's really fun to get to do a talk uh, in, in person again. It's it's been a while, and so this is uh, this is a great, great opportunity. Um, I do want to start today by acknowledging that UBCO and the DRAO are located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. And, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this truly beautiful land. So I uh, really appreciate it that. Right. So today we'll be talking about this, this topic that I called quiet skies for radio astronomy. Uh, we were thinking about whether to call it dark skies. Dark skies is a term more associated with optical. So I'll explain a little bit what I mean by uh, quiet in this context. But basically, I'm going to be talking about um, the effects of human-made interfering signals on, on radio astronomy in general. There we go. Okay, so for, for starters, what do we mean by when I say the word quiet? So there is maybe a bit of a, a, a misconception that's been propagated by movies and such where we associate the word radio with sound. So um, if any of you have seen the movie uh, Contact, which is uh, one of the more famous <laughs> movies about radio astronomy, uh, in which uh, Joey Foster plays this character who uh, sits in front of the, the, the telescope dishes at the, at the BLA and, and listens to the signals with, the, with this, this uh, set of headphones. So as radio astronomers, we don't actually listen to the, the, the signals from space. Um, this idea of, of how radio waves are, are connected to sound. First of all, radio waves are not sound waves. I think many of you have backgrounds in, in physics uh, probably know that. Um, but I guess the, the, the connection comes from the fact that when we listen to the radio, as in this, this device on which we listen to uh, the, new, the news or, or music or whatever, what we're listening to is sound waves and in that context, the information is encoded into radio waves by a, a process called modulation. There's two different ways, basically, that you can do that. Frequency modulation, amplitude modulation, where you have a uh, carrier signal, which is your, your, your radio wave, and you encode information about the, the audio information that, that, that you want to actually have your, your, your listener hear. And then your, your, your device, which is your radio that you're listening to, decodes that information and turns it into sound waves through your speaker so you can hear that. So in principle, we could, you know, we could do this with, with signals from space in, in radio astronomy, but that's not the typical way that we, that we process that kind of information. It's much more useful to be able to visualize it into things like maps of the sky and other, other ways that we, that we typically analyze those data. All right, so... What are radio waves? Well, this is the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm going to pause for a sec. There's a bunch of people outside. Do you think there are there? Wait, I keep seeing people walk by. I don't know if they're trying to get in here or if they're looking for something else. Um, anyway, so this is this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, there are come on in. There are a bunch of different types of things that we call waves. So things like gamma rays, x-rays, um, what we know as, as light, uh, radio waves. These are all just electromagnetic waves having different wavelengths. So their properties are basically determined by the, the, the wavelengths that they have. Um, and so we could kind of, we could refer to, to, to radio waves as light as well. You could kind of use the, the, the words electromagnetic radiation and light interchangeably if you wanted to. 
there are sort of two convenient windows for doing um, astronomy from Earth, so Earth-based astronomy. Um, and what I mean by that is um, parts of the spectrum for which the atmosphere is transparent. So we can actually get the waves coming through the atmosphere, making it all the way uh, to Earth so that we can observe them. And the optical range or the, the visible light range is, of course, one of these. And the other is the radio uh, range. So we have this other convenient gap covering a wide range of frequencies that we can we can easily observe uh, uh, waves coming from, from space. So that's where radio fits in. And in terms of the kinds of telescopes that we use, um, some of the, the, the sort of telescopes, like images that you might have, um, if you just think of astronomy or optical astronomy in general, are, are telescopes like the one uh, the one on, on the, in the top row there, like uh, these you know, telescopes that you might use for, for amateur astronomy. This is a, a picture of a, a replica of uh, Newton's uh, reflecting optical telescope, um, uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Of course, that's in the, more in the infrared, but you can consider that a, an optical instrument. And then the, uh, the Keck Observatory um, in Hawaii on Mauna Kea, which is one of the, the world's largest uh, optical uh, telescopes. And so these are these mainly consist of mirrors, basically, is, is, is what's used to, to, to collect the light. Radio telescopes look a little bit different. Um, they look like these giant satellite dishes, typically, although we'll see a few uh, different types that I'll, that I'll show throughout the talk here. So just a little bit about the, uh, the background, the origins of radio astronomy. It was actually established kind of by accident uh, by a physicist and radio engineer by the name of Carl Jansky. So he was working for uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories. Uh, this was in the, the 1930s. And his job was to um, investigate sources of static that could affect transatlantic radio communication. So in a way, he, he was already looking at interference, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. But at the time, it was interference with communications technologies that people were trying to develop, whereas now I'm talking about interference with trying to observe the, the sky. So he basically accidentally observed the, uh, the portion of the Milky Way galaxy that, that emits in, in, in radio uh, with, with this uh, kind of crazy looking uh, instrument that he, that he built, again, not for that purpose, but for the purpose of, of, of studying um, the, the, the properties of, of static affecting communications. And so what the way that uh, he figured out that this, uh, the source of the signal that he was seeing was actually coming from, you know, some kind of uh, astronomical source uh, was by observing the, the period of it. So it repeated every sidereal day, which is what you would expect from something that is you know, astronomical in, in nature. And so this was, this is how basically Radio astronomy was born, but but kind of in an accidental way. And I believe uh, Jansky himself didn't didn't go on to do very much uh, radio astronomy after this. I think he continued with uh, with different uh, jobs at uh, at Bell Labs. Um, so the next person who who came along who kind of developed this further uh, was Rote Reber who in 1937 basically built a telescope in his backyard, which was kind of cool. So this telescope uh, looked a lot more like the you know, modern radio telescopes that, uh, that we would see. It was this, uh, this parabolic dish that would focus the, the emission at a, a, at a single point where it could be collected. And so he extended Jansky's work and basically went on to produce um, the first radio sky survey. And at the time, these, these maps of the sky that you could produce um, from, from this kind of information uh, would look something like this, just these, these very simple looking contour plots of, of the intensity of the mission that you're seeing from different, different parts of the sky. Um, so this was in the 30s and I, and I believe for, for several years at the time, he was basically the only radio astronomer on the planet. So it took a little while for this to, uh, to become a, a, a standard um, aspect of, of astronomy. So nowadays we have radio telescopes that look something like this. This is just a handful of examples uh, of, of different ones from, from around the world. So first one, many of you may have seen if you've been on, on the 
tours at the at the observatory, or Alex may have shown you pictures of our telescopes from from the DRAO. Um, so this is this is located uh, near Penticton. So that's the the place that I work, and this is one of the telescopes that I have used in the in the past for for various things. This is a telescope that's 26 meters in diameter. Um, as far as single dish telescopes go, it's actually kind of on the on the smaller side. There are many larger ones in the world. So the, the second one that I'm showing here is the Parkes 64 meter diameter telescope. This is in Australia. Um, there are even bigger ones, such as the, the Green Bank 100 meter telescope uh, in in West Virginia. And then, so these these are kind of the, the the biggest telescopes that you can have that are fully steerable, so you can point them anywhere you want on the on the sky. Um, come on in, folks. If you're, here, if you're here for astronomy, come on in. Yes. Um, but there's other other types of designs that have been built. Uh, ones where you can't take the whole dish and and tilt it around to to, to point it in different directions. But the, the dish is actually built into the ground and it's fixed. So examples of these are the Arecibo 300 meter telescope, which unfortunately a couple of years ago collapsed and is no longer operational for, for that reason, sadly. Um, and the fast 500 meter telescope in, in China. So with these ones, the way that, that you're able to, to steer it to some extent is by uh, by moving the the focus around uh, rather than moving the the entire dish. So it's just a little bit of a a different way. Um, so you might you know you might notice a trend here. We keep wanting to build bigger and bigger dishes. Two reasons for for wanting larger radio dishes are that you get better resolution, the bigger the dishes, and better sensitivity. So you're able to see fainter signals with it. In terms of the resolution, it goes as basically the wavelength divided by the diameter of the dish. So the larger your dish, the smaller this, this theta parameter, which is, which is your resolution. So the, the smaller the structures that you're able to see. Now, there's a limit to how large you can make your, your dishes without potentially encountering, <laughs> encountering problems. Um, this is a picture of the a uh, 300 foot telescope that was located at Green Bank. And it unfortunately in, I think it was 1988, it collapsed due to, um, I think it must've been just a, some kind of mechanical fault that over the years just uh, uh, caused it to sort of collapse under its own weight. And so at the time there were some Comical speculations about what this caused, what caused it, it's not not zapped by hostile aliens. It was, uh, yeah, it, it it sort of just collapsed under under its own weight. So there are, I mean, we can do better since then. It, this 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 telescope, I mean, not the same telescope, but a similar size one was rebuilt. That's what the, the Green Bank hundred meter is, and it's perfectly <laughs> safe and operational and functional. No, but nonetheless, you, you can't really go much bigger than, than that sort of diameter, have it be fully steerable and, and, and operational in that way. So there's a different solution to this. Um, and this is a, a different type of radio telescope that is now more and more commonly being used. And it is called a, uh, a synthesis array or a synthesis telescope or an array of interferometers. And the way this works is that instead of having one gigantic telescope, you have multiple, several or many smaller telescopes working together. And won't get into the, the, the details of, of the, the math for, for why that works, but basically the furthest distance apart between the, the, you know, the furthest apart antennas in your array, that distance is effectively like the diameter of an equivalent gigantic single dish telescope. So that tells you your resolution. So the further, further apart those elements, the better your resolution. But then you also want to have other, uh, other elements to fill in the other spatial information because you're not going to get a nice map of the sky if all you have are two antennas that are, that are extremely far apart. Um, so it, it's, it's not, It'd be nice if it were that easy, if you could just <laughs> make a beautiful image of the, of the sky with all the spatial details in it and, and, and everything. 
but you can't. You you need you need many of these of these antennas working uh, working together to achieve that purpose. So this is this example is the, the synthesis telescope at at the DRAO. Um, it has seven elements. I think there's only six visible in the picture. Yeah, there's one more off to to that end. Um, and so this this one's been been operational uh, for for quite a few decades now in, in its current state. It's actually undergoing uh, pretty soon some, some major uh, upgrades to sort of bring it into the, the, the modern era of, of radio astronomy and keep it, keep it operational and keep it uh, uh, useful for doing, doing really cool science. That's one example uh, of an interferometer array. And then there are others around the world that have some of them use much bigger dishes and many more of them. Um, like the example is a, a very large array in New Mexico. Um, this also, instead of having the, the dishes aligned just along one east-west line, you have it, you have them arranged in some kind of configuration that uh, speeds up the, the mapping process a little bit. So things like that. Um, and there, there are many more of these, you know, this is this is like I said, the Sort of the the future of, of radio astronomy is building more of these types of telescopes. These are um, what's going to allow us to have the the kind of resolution that we need to 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 really do some of the the most cutting edge uh, science coming forward. Another example that may not be uh, may not obviously fall into into this category is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment Telescope or, or Chime. So this is another another telescope at DRAO. It has this funny shape of uh, these kind of four half pipe looking things, and along each uh, line down the the center of the the telescope, basically each of those is uh, is populated with a whole bunch of of feeds. Um, and so what you what you get is as the radio waves come uh, hit the telescope, reflect um, onto this what we call focal line. You get information by combining um, combining the information from every single pair of of feeds along all of those focal lines, and the the sort of the, the mathematical process to take that information and turn it into an image is the same as for, for any uh, interferometer array. So this telescope, even though it doesn't look like a classic interferometer, operates in, in the same, uh, same manner. So the, the primary purpose of uh, CHIME, the, the reason that it was built, was to study the expansion history of the universe. But it's kind of branched out into other um, other areas of, of astronomy as well, um, doing uh, pulsar science, uh, fast radio bursts. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but also doing galactic science, which is what um, Alex and Nasser and I are uh, currently interested in. And so I'll just highlight a project that uh, that Nasser is working on with uh, data from from this particular instrument. So he's looking at uh, studying magnetic field structures within the Milky Way, and he found this um, this interesting patch within within one of these uh, chime polarization data maps, where around this this sort of compact little structure, there's an abrupt change in the polarization angle of the the the, uh, the signal that's coming from that part of the sky, and so NASA is working on. Uh, Kind of trying to figure out what what's causing this, what what this object might be associated with. So I just wanted to highlight that as a a local uh, bit of research being done with with this particular telescope. All right. So what 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 can we do with radio astronomy? What what is the advantage of it? Why do we want to use radio astronomy in addition to to optical? So. Here's one example where looking at the same region of the sky, you've got some galaxies in here, M81, M82, NGC 3077. And on the left is the, the optical image of that, and on the right is the radio counterpart. And so what, what you're seeing there is there's, there's a striking difference between those images. The optical is going to be mostly tracing the, 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 the density of stars in those, in those galaxies. Whereas with the radio, you're able to see all of this hydrogen gas that's actually extending 
much further out and is even um you know forming kind of uh you know connections between uh between these galaxy structures and so there's a lot uh, a lot more and different information that you can get from looking at at these the, the emission from from galaxies and objects in radio and comparing them to to other parts of the spectrum like optical one of the the biggest discoveries um in, in radio astronomy uh, was the discovery of uh, pulsars, or rather the, the observational uh, confirmation that these things exist. So pulsars are these uh, rapidly rotating magnetized neutron stars that have really strong magnetic fields, and what you get is this beaming effect along the, uh, the magnetic axis. But if that magnetic axis is not aligned with the, the rotation axis, then what you get is this sort of lighthouse effect as the as the uh, the neutron star spins around and the, the observational effect of this is that it's going to emit these uh beams of really sort of short bursts of emission at a very at very regular intervals and so these were first observed by uh Jocelyn Bell Burnell um who's a, a, a PhD student and her supervisor Anthony Hewish in 1937 um Hewish went on to win the Nobel Prize for this, and unfortunately, um, Jocelyn Bell-Burnell was not included in that. That's kind of a sad fact in the, the history of, of radio astronomy. Um, but yes, credit to, to her for, uh, for this discovery. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, this chart that you see here, this is a, an example of what um, radio astronomy data looked like in, in, you know, in, in those days. Um, I have the wrong date here, not 1937, I, uh, <laughs> 67, sorry about that, that makes way more sense since I just said that Reber was the only radio astronomer in the 1930s, so, sorry, 67, that should be, but what I wanted to say was that this, uh, this, this chart is what the observations would have looked like at the time, so it, it a lot of that data was just recorded on these, uh, these strip charts and then had to be, uh, interpreted from that, whereas nowadays with the, the computer technology that we have to take radio data and turn it into images, we, you know, it's kind of, well, it's a lot easier to get these, these spectacular looking uh, images of the sky. So that's, that's sort of what, what data looked like uh, back in the, the early days of radio astronomy. Something else that we do quite a lot of uh, nowadays is making uh, maps of the entire sky to, to, to look at various uh, various components. So these examples are uh, from another project that Alex and I were uh, involved in called the Global Magnetoionic Medium Survey. And this it, the, the goal of the survey is to, to map out basically the entire sky in, in polarization. And so there's there's you know, particular information you can get from uh, from polarized emission. And the, the top image here is showing just a map of that, uh, that emission from the, the portion of the Milky Way that we can see from, from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so you can see these, these, these particular bright uh, patches where you're getting a lot of, a lot of polarized emission. Um, and that's, that's tracing certain, certain structures in the magnetic ion, uh, ionized medium in, in the Milky Way. The, the bottom panel here is showing uh, a way to map the magnetic fields from that. So if you compare, I'll talk a little more about this later on as well, compare uh, uh, the polarized observations across different wavelengths um, that, you're, that you're observing across, you can work out some information about magnetic field structures as well. So more or less on a map like this, the regions that are red are places where the magnetic field is on average, directed towards the observer, whereas the blue represents the, the opposite sense of, of magnetic field. So that's just another example of the, 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 the type of, of observation that we can do. All right, so kind of on to the, 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 the point that I, that I want to talk about today, um, light pollution. I think you're all, you're all quite familiar with, uh, with this concept if you, try to, to go out and observe the night sky uh, from within the city, it's, it's quite problematic. Chances are, I'm not sure, I haven't spent that much time in Kelowna, but I, I assume you're not, you're not seeing much more than about 
this from anywhere within the within the city, right? And so you really have to go very, very far from from cities to be able to see uh, the the spectacular kind of structures that you would you know you should be able to see of the of the of the Milky Way from Earth. So in in optical astronomy, this is this is the real problem: light pollution. So for uh, for for any optical purposes, what you what you need to do is is to get away from from these artificial lights in order to not have that contaminate your 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 data basically. Now in radio astronomy, we have something equivalent to that, which is what we call radio frequency interference. And this is this is the problem of being surrounded by human made signals in in the the, the radio regime. So what this huge mess is is a chart of the uh, Canadian radio spectrum allocations. That is the parts of the, the, the radio band that are specifically allocated to, to particular things like you know, communications, uh, cell phones, uh, television, um, you know, communications for, for airplanes. Those are, those are going to be specific frequencies. And there are very limited uh, ranges within this that are reserved specifically for radio astronomy. So nobody is allowed to transmit um, signals at those particular frequencies. But there are not very many of them. They are on this, I'll, I'll show you doing divergent in a sec, but on this chart, they are colored in light, this greenish yellowish color right there. So all of those tiny blips within this, this gigantic spectrum are the only, only places that are actually reserved for, for radio astronomy. One example of this is the uh, 1420 megahertz band, which uh, is, is set aside for radio astronomy for the purpose of, of, of studying hydrogen. So this is the, the one of the main tracers uh, in, in the radio regime of, of, of gas in the, uh, in the interstellar medium. So that's set aside. Um, the other, this band I, I picked out here covering from 300 megahertz up to about a gigahertz. I'm interested in that band because I'm working on a telescope at the observatory that covers that. Chime is also in that, uh, in that range. And within this range too, there are only very, very small gaps that are, like I said, protected for radio astronomy. And so, Anywhere else, we we can have signals from you know from from these other sources that that heavily affect our our data and and they're really really problematic. So I'll go on to talking a bit now about what radio frequency interference actually looks like, uh, a bit about what we can do about it, and I'll do this with some examples uh, from one particular telescope at the DRO. And this is the telescope. So this is a 15 meter single dish uh, telescope, um, formerly known as the Dish Verification Antenna 2. It had this funny name because it was designed and built initially as a prototype for the Square Kilometer Array, which is this big uh, international uh, project in which you know there's Canadian contributions being made to this. One of one of them was to, to, to study these uh, these prototypes of telescopes that could be used for it. So it had this it had this name because it was I guess we we're verifying that it works or some such. I don't quite know, but anyway, we're we're now calling it the DRAO 15 meter to to give it a bit of a more descriptive name because we have now uh, moved on to actually using this telescope uh, locally on site for for science purposes. So it has this, this interesting structure. Uh, it's a, an offset Gregorian reflector. It's a bit hard to see it in this picture, but the instead of having the, the focus at the at the center above a, a symmetric parabolic shaped uh, dish, you have it offset to one side. I'll show some other pictures of it. And like I said, we're we're studying uh, we're studying uh, emission in this 300 megahertz to one gigahertz range. It's an alt azimuth mount telescope. Um, maybe that means something to those of you who uh, maybe play with telescopes. I don't know. Um, but what what that means is it that its two axes are um, one is the the azimuth, which rotates like this parallel to the surface of of the Earth, and then the 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 uh, the altitude or the elevation axis is is perpendicular to that. That's that's what that means. 
So the science that we're doing with, uh, with this telescope, the, the goal of it is similar to that GMEMS project I mentioned earlier, is to map the polarized emission from the whole northern sky um, across a really broad range of frequencies. And again, as I mentioned before, polarized radio emission encodes information about galactic magnetic field structures and the ionized interstellar medium. And these things are important because galactic magnetic fields are understood to play an important role in a lot of uh, the, the physical processes in the, the, the galaxy and the universe. And we need to know what the magnetic field structure of the Milky Way looks like. So that's that's the goal that we uh, that we set out to to do the survey with. So we have this large team of, uh, of people involved, uh, a whole bunch of um, technologists, engineers um, at the DRO working on this to, to get the, the telescope actually up and running. And then there's a, a group of us um, uh, scientists working on this this actual science project with it, and and many students involved as well, whose uh, contributions I will highlight here. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, like I said, it's an alt altazimuth mount telescope, and so the way, the way that it, uh, that we make use of that for mapping out the sky is we scan back and forth in azimuth just at, at two fixed elevations, and that motion combined with the motion of the Earth is going to actually allow us to map out with, a, with you know, thousands of these scans um, map out the, the entire northern sky. And so this the survey has been completed. It took about seven months total to, to collect all those data. And whoops, that didn't work. I have to show video. So this is just a, a little video that uh, PhD student Becky Booth, who's working with us, uh, created to show quickly uh, how, how the telescope scan. This is sped up a lot. It, it actually, one scan to go in one direction takes uh, about 18 minutes. And so we had, like I said, 2,880 of these scans completed. And the result of that was a pseudo map of the sky that looks like this. I say pseudo map because we're still working on the data processing, the calibration for, for, for these data. So the, the stripiness that you see in this map each each of those stripes is basically one of these one of these scans, and the signal level between them fluctuates uh, because of certain components in the telescope being dependent on outside temperature. And so, as you know, over the course of six or seven months, there's a huge variation in in the temperatures uh, at at the observatory. And so that's what the striping effect is. And so Becky and I right now are working on the the calibration steps to get this get this all smoothed out and make it into, into a proper map. And this is just at one, one single frequency. We have thousands of frequency channels, so thousands of these maps, basically. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot to process, but uh, yeah, making, making progress toward that. And this is, this is the same thing. I should say that the first map that I showed here is in uh, total intensity, whereas the second map here is in polarized intensity. So um, the, the unpolarized versus the, the polarized component of the emission. And so you see they, they, they look quite different, and that is, that is to be expected. The polarized sky fundamentally looks different from... Question, yeah. yeah. Why, why do you have like no data between, like, say, 0 to 40? This patch? Yeah. That's the part of the sky that, from the northern hemisphere, we can never see because it's right. through the Earth, simply. So if you would have like an exactly exactly the same system on the southern hemisphere at the same latitude. Yeah. Um, and longitude, would you get the other half of the exactly? Yes, yes. And and in fact, this is this is this is the ultimate goal. So this this GMEMS project, it, it's actually a, a global collaboration. And the goal is for you know those of us working on telescopes in the northern hemisphere to get this part of the map. And the Parkes Telescope in Australia, which is not at the same, not at the same exact equivalent latitude, but but close enough that that the two maps are are complementary in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Another question. So what makes the trail of the meters so much more effective or like what's the difference between the data and for example what the synthesis telescope can be? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So a couple of things. Um with the the 50 meter with a single single dish telescope we can map the whole sky quite quickly 
I say seven months, um, that's quite fast uh, in uh, on the time scales of you know, yeah, mapping, mapping the entire sky. So in seven months, we were able to map the entire sky with something like the, the synthesis telescope, just mapping the galactic disk, which was a, a project called the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey that was done um, a couple of decades ago now. I, we just had this conversation and I've forgotten the dates again exactly, but... <laughs> 95 95 95 yeah so it, it took 10 years with that telescope to map just i'll point it out here approximately just this strip more or less and so mapping mapping speed is one you know, one one part of that equation and so we're able to actually map the whole sky quickly with it um, and the other is that a single dish telescope is more sensitive to the large scale structures. The, the goal of this survey is to map out large scale structures on the sky. The synthesis telescope by itself is much better for studying really fine detailed structures, smaller, uh, smaller objects uh, within, within the Milky Way. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 The temperature and aspect on the data. Yeah. How? How? <laughs> so the 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 signal. I mean, the the signal goes through a lot from from the point where it it you know it reflects off of the dish um, into the into the feed, and then it gets converted into uh, an electronic signal uh, and enters cables, which come down uh, from the from the telescope. Um, at, at some point, it gets uh, um, transferred to, to an optical fiber cable, and it's those components that, that, that we think are, are, are temperature sensitive. And so just the, that, the baseline signal level fluctuates up and down. You, you have the same information contained in the data. You just have to calibrate for that, that fluctuation of the signal level. Well, thank, thanks for the questions, you guys. This is this is awesome. Moving onwards to talk about RFI. So this this is an example of what what RFI looks like. So let me let me just break this down about what we're looking at. I said that the our telescope scans back and forth, um, you know, three sixty degrees once every eighteen minutes. So this is a this is an eighteen minute segment of data, and along the the vertical axis you have all of the different frequency channels that, that we're looking at. So piled up here, there's actually something like 8,000 channels. Doesn't all get resolved properly on this, this JPEG version of the image that I printed out. But nonetheless, you can see how the signal changes with, uh, with frequency. So we call this a waterfall plot. Um, sometimes, sometimes these are plotted the other way with frequency on the bottom axis. In my head, it makes more sense this way with time on the... Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is how I've been making so it, it contains the information, um, basically all of the data from the telescope scan for, for one single scan across all the frequencies. Uh, the white lines on here are just gaps in the data where we do a calibration. So those are, there's a little, won't get into details here, but there's a calibration noise diode that gets turned on and off quickly once every few minutes to do a calibration. So we mask those out because those are not not good data to, to to use the point here is these strong yellow bands that you see the horizontal bands those are the those are the interference that's always there so some of that this this band here uh, just above 700 megahertz uh that's the lte band so for your 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 mobile communications uh there's a bunch of these uh six megahertz wide uh stripes down there those are uh, tv stations so these kinds of things are are always there and so those data we always need to get rid of yeah um and what was that that vertical band between 10 36 and 10 that's, yeah that's an actual source on the sky oh so that is if we are scanning you know scanning across the sky i don't know if we go back to our map so that might have been something like a one of these stripes that went through the the center of the the disk of the galaxy and then you get a you get a bump in the a bump in the signal but the way the way that you can know that this is this is a, an astronomical signal and not 
not RFI or not, not human made, is that it covers the entire frequency range. And that's what we expect from the, the spectrum of these sources. So something we have to do right away uh, in our analysis, just one sec, let me just finish saying this. And then one thing we have to do right away is definitely mask out those channels that are always bad. So this is some work that was uh, started by uh, co-op student Luca Galler and continued by uh, Becky Booth to develop basically a mask that we're going to apply to just all of the data that we that we collect with this telescope for the whole survey. Question. So it's the theoretically if alien were talking to us using LP, we just wouldn't know. Uh, yeah, basically, I guess. If they were if they weren't loud enough, then they they the, those signals could very well just get mixed into yeah I hadn't thought about that before <laughs> this way for aliens to despise themselves good question all right so we're we're throwing out the yeah go ahead what what makes you choose the specific frequency to analyze uh this particular range of frequencies the the like that that's covered by this entire uh, so, so a few things we want. Um, this is a this is a frequency range that we don't have yet. We don't have this this part of the spectrum yet, and it's these lower frequencies. This is relatively low frequency, and the kind of astronomy we're doing um, are really necessary for working out the details in the structures of the magnetic field. That's uh, you need a couple of things for that. You need really broadband frequency coverage. But you will you specifically need the low frequencies for it, and so we're basically tackling a, a, a part of this data collection problem that just hasn't hasn't been done yet. The other the other part of it is a is a convenience factor. We we had a receiver available that covers these frequencies, and so it yeah put those together, and and, and here we go. We making making good use of that. So yeah. Uh, yeah, this is this is what it would look like in, in one dimension. So if you just did a cut along um, at any one particular time, a cut vertically like this, then 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 this is what the this is what that spectrum looks like. Just to give you an idea of how much brighter those those yellow well they're not yellow anymore because I masked them out, but how much brighter they are compared to the the sort of overall spectrum of the the, the background uh, that that you're seeing. The the blue and orange here were just different different iterations of this 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 RFI mask that we had created so the er earliest version didn't cut out enough of the signal so we had to uh, kind of revisit that to make sure that everything was getting cut out that needed to be one thing that uh, is maybe a bit misleading about these pictures is it might look like this entire frequency range is, is lost in the data but if you zoom in on it like I said there's 8,000 channels in here so you do actually pick up um, a little, a little bit, little bits of data in between there. So this is a reason that we, with with the modern technology we have, we can do this to have really fine frequency channels, and we need that to be able to pick out those 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 very narrow bands that are that are still good data. And again, that's what it looks like in, in one dimension. So you know, you you do have a handful of of usable frequencies in there. We think we're gonna. Uh, go ahead with the the processing on that and see how the see how the maps turn out in those uh, those frequency ranges. Another challenge, of course, is the RFI environment isn't constant either. It changes um, over the course of our observation. This is what the this is what a scan looked like in early June, and then another similar scan in late August. One thing we right away noticed is that there's a there's an entire new band that showed up there. So we had to add that to our mask and say that those frequencies are also no good. There's some that uh, that that look like they they disappeared. There's ones that kind of come and go. Um, but for the most part, it's it's more more bands being added as as time passes, unfortunately. All right, so then another another type of RFI. So this is the, what I was showing you there was the the RFI that's that's always there. So in some sense, it's easier to deal with as we just pick out those channels, um, get rid of them. But there are other ones where it's only there from time to time, and these are these little uh, little square rectangular patches that 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 appear uh, in, in in certain places. 
Um, so this the, the ones up at around 840 megahertz, um, those come from um, if people are near the telescopes with their cell phones, you know, actively in use, then that you're going to get those blips of, of, of signals there. So these need to be masked out. Um, they have some properties we can make use of to, to do that. Um, one is that usually they have very sharp boundaries and frequency. So they're not like our, our friendly astronomical sources that, that extend out along a, a broad range of frequencies. These are usually quite, you know, quite well contained in, in, in frequency. So that's one property we can use to, to try to flag those. So some of you might know Leo Caffarello. He was a student here. So he did some work with us on, on this particular aspect, trying to uh, develop an algorithm that masks out these, these patches of RFI. So here's an example of uh, his code applied to uh, this particular uh, scan. And you can see that it does a good job, if we zoom in, it does a good job of uh, masking out these, uh, these, these kind of rectangular looking, looking patches of, of, of RFI. But it's tricky, it's hard to get the, there's different thresholds in the code to say, you know, what what do we get rid of, what do we keep, and it can get it can get pretty tricky to to fine tune those so that we're throwing out what we need to throw out and and keeping as much data, good quality data as, as possible. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of our that's one of our challenges. Um, just to give you an idea again of how bright or loud the signals are here's a here's a plot to show that just a sec let me just finish this up um so again this is this is now a cut in at one particular frequency at 840 megahertz so up here uh, a cut along the, the time axis and so what you're seeing is that tiny little blip in the middle is actually where we we cross that the galactic disk as as as, as we pointed out and all of that signal that gigantic signal around it is just way 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 higher and it's it's kind of even worse than what appears on this on this graph because this is on a log scale. It's in units of dB. So uh, you know that's a difference of, of, of 20 dB. That's a that's a factor of 100 in, in, in the in the power. And so you're if you had these these RFI blips happening on top of sources that you're interested in looking at, they're going to be completely drowned out. You're not going to be able to see them. Uh, there's a question. Yeah. Kind of like do you use that image algorithm to bring out the data or I didn't hear the first part. Do we use image algorithms? Image algorithms? Yeah. Like how do you claim this? Yeah, there's so I was actually I was talking to Jocelyn about this this morning because we we are actually thinking about potentially looking into machine learning to 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 try to try to approach this problem in the long run. Um, for for our purposes here, we wanted kind of just a quick and dirty solution that would you know get 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 the job done for now. Um, and so what Leo came up with he, his 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 uh, strategy is basically in it does it in two steps. It looks both along the time domain and along the frequency domain, and it looks for basically sharp increases and flags those as the edges of of, of the RFI event. But sure, there are. Definitely other techniques out there, and we definitely need more expertise on this to 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 do a good job of these kinds of uh, this kind of flagging. Yep. And here's an example of a, a type of source that's actually really turned out to be really tricky to 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 flag. That blip up there, we kept seeing this. If you remember, I, I showed you how the telescope scans. So it does these back and forth um, 360 uh, in, in, in azimuth. And we were always seeing this, this funny looking blip at these two very particular positions, the directions in, in, in azimuth. We, we couldn't figure out for a, for, for a while what this was. Um, and we reached out to some folks who are experts in identifying sources of RFI, and it turned out um, that this is most likely a, uh, the, the source is a Russian communication satellite called Meridian Constellation that happens to emit um, in, in our frequency, at that particular frequency, and it has this funny looking eccentric shaped orbit that's designed to um, optimize um, basically constant coverage at really high geographic latitudes. 
And so just the way that geometry works out every once in a while at these particular <laughs> positions in our scans, we see this, 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 this really large blip that's likely coming from these satellites. Um, the, the gentleman who, who helped us figure this out, uh, Scott Tilly, he's a, uh, amateur astronomer and he, he does a lot of this identifying mystery satellites in the sky. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, look up his, uh, his blog on that. Um, so if you zoom in on it, it looks like this, it's this, this awful looking blob. And if we, we apply Leo's uh, RFI excision code to it, it gets rid of some of it, but not all of it. And the, the problem is, the reason it's hard to, hard to identify this as, as RFI is that it, in the time domain, it's actually very, very smooth. And the, the reason for that is it's not something that's turning on and off quickly. It's, it's always there. It's just we, we scan across it. So in a sense, it is a, it is a source on the sky, but it's not a, an astronomical source. It's unfortunately just a, a satellite that happens to be in the way. So one of the, one of the challenges. Here's an example of how it looks when the RFI is really, really bad. So there was uh, there's a lot of work that, that, that's done on site. Um, there are telescopes that are actually being built on site. So a lot of uh, contract workers come and go and not everyone is aware that you should definitely have your cell phones off when you're, you're close to the telescopes. And so this was, <laughs> thanks for coming. This was, uh, this was a, 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 an event um, during which we, we happened to be observing and very likely there was somebody with a, with a cell phone turned on right close to the telescope and it actually this this huge mess here that the signal saturating the the uh the 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 receiver system of the telescope so that's what it looks like when it's very bad so we definitely don't want that all right on to uh, uh some other rfi kind of mysteries from from other parts of the world um this is kind of an interesting story from the uh the the parks observatory in australia so fast radio bursts are these really short radio pulses. Um, they're a few milliseconds to a few seconds in duration. And they're, they're caused by some uh, high energy astrophysical process likely uh, related to neutron stars. Still kind of, there, there's a lot of investigation going on into figuring out uh, what, what exactly the source of these is. But the, the characteristic signal of this uh, this this type of source is that they have a high dispersion measure. This, they have uh, dispersive properties, and what that means is that the signal from them kind of sweeps downward in frequency with time. So that's shown in the in the the, the image here on the on the left, and this is um, due to the fact that um, through the the ionized interstellar medium, different frequencies of of emission. Are going to have slightly different group velocities and so if the source is, is far enough away you're going to get this delay in when the signal arrives from um uh, that, that, that's at different frequencies so this is sort of a, a characteristic structure of a fast radio burst and the the first of these was uh discovered that uh, was published in uh 2007 and then you know more and more of these got uh were, were observed over the years uh, lately, uh, Chime is is uh, kind of mass producing observations of, of of these types of objects. So it's it's become uh, quite an interest quite an interesting uh, area of, of radio astronomy to to learn about the, the properties of these things. But one of the interesting things that happened um, was that at the Parks Observatory there were some mystery signals that were that were observed that kind of had a similar similar looking profile um to to these 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 fast radio bursts frbs and it turned out that that they weren't frbs at all they were emission from a microwave located on one site so what happened it, it took it took a while to figure out that, that this was the source of it and the reason is it's not, it's not the astronomers being that silly. It, the, it's sort of a tricky reason. The, the microwave itself operates at a much higher frequency than, than the, the, the frequency range in which the, the telescope was observing. So it wasn't thought to be a, a problematic 
thing. But it turns out that if instead of waiting for the microwave cycle to, to finish, if you just yank open the door while it's still running, then for a for a fraction of a second, as the as the the the, the magnet system in there is powering down, you get the this, this downward sweeping uh, structure and in, in, in frequency from the signal from it. And so it, it took a while to figure this out, but but once they they did, they were able to to identify, you know, which of which of the these kind of mystery signals they were seeing were coming from this this rogue microwave and and, and which were actually um, astronomical in nature. Well, one of the one of the, the sort of telling signs of this was that these 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 fake FRBs were clustered around lunchtime, which <laughs> wouldn't really be any other reason for that for, for uh, a, a human source of, of that. So that was an interesting kind of thing that, that can happen. And just an example of how radio astronomy can be kind of tricky and confusing because all we're doing is we're, like, we're looking, at that, looking at these signals that, that you know, we, we ourselves generate kind of similar one, similar types of signals sometimes. So what else can we do apart from, um, from the, the kinds of things that, that, that I've mentioned? Um, one, one thing for sure is to actively monitor sources of RFI at um, observatory sites. So things like, you know, are there rogue microwaves that we should be watching for? Are there, uh, you know, employees coming on site that have cars that have OnStar or something that emits a little blip every few minutes, things like that. And to catch these events and, and, and eliminate the sources if possible before we contaminate too much of the, the data with it. Um, another thing from a, from a technological standpoint is, I, I mentioned this a bit, is really dense sampling in the frequency domain so that you can pick out the good frequency slices in between the, the, the contaminated ones. And also along with that, very fine uh, signal digitization so that you're able to uh, still detect uh, detect uh, the, the the really tiny radio signals from the sky uh, in the presence of of RFI around them, um, and then things like real time flagging of RFI. I was talking to one of our uh, uh, software engineers on site about this recently. He was saying that we store so much bad data because we're doing a lot of this RFI removal in the post processing, whereas it would be really nice to just you know, remove it on the fly and not, not store those bad data in the first place. Um, and then, like I mentioned a bit earlier, developing new, new flagging techniques. So machine learning might very well be uh, a, a big part of this. And I think um, you know, involvement from, from the experts in, in this kind of group is, uh, is really valuable. Other things, there's, there's other observatories out there. Uh, this is an example, the uh, Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia actually has a very strict policy about what kind of emission can or cannot take place in the, in the surrounding region. So there's a national radio quiet zone that covers 13,000 square miles. I didn't convert this to kilometers, sorry, I got the, got the number from, from the, uh, the NRA website. Um, but there's a, there's a smaller region so, so there's some restriction that is in, in this, in this uh, broad region, but in a uh, smaller region um, close, close to the observatory, so within 10 miles or such, some such, uh, you can't have cell phones or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth at all. And this has actually led to there being a community of people who live around this site who actually um, prefer that lifestyle of not having the, you know, the modern technological connection. Um, some of them also believe that the, the, the health benefits of, of being away from, uh, you know, radio emitting uh, stuff is a, is a beneficial thing. And so they, they, they like to live there in that, that kind of community. So Green Bank is, uh, is great for that reason, because it, it is very much radio quiet. Yeah, question. Doesn't that all be fixed by just using, like, wired internet and landlines. Sure. Yep. And so that's why I put up, you know, telephone booths are still a thing in, in Green Bank. Definitely. Yeah. There, there are, I mean, I, so I've, I've been to the site there and they, they do have internet connection, but it's, yeah, it's all, it's not Wi-Fi. It's, well, yeah. it's I mean, wired. wired internet is usually more, it's like better <laughs> for, in terms of like Wi-Fi cuts out sometimes. There's that too. Sure. So 
I don't know why people would live there being like, oh, I don't have the connection. You can just say, I'm not going to use the internet or phones in modern society as well. Well, that's, I mean, fair. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite, <laughs> I don't quite know the answer to that. Yeah. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't wires also release RF, RF uh, signals? Like just, just like a bare wire, wouldn't that also release RF signals? Yeah, like? yeah. So, so optical fiber is the, the way to, to, to get around that. Right. Yeah, I shouldn't say just wire. That's right. Um, some good news recently that 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 we learned about for for our observatory near Penticton is that uh, there has been legislation proposed to continue to protect the the observatory in certain ways that that have been done for for many years, but that legislation was uh, I think set to expire in the next year or so, and so it's really good that this is uh, this is being extended and being being uh, addressed. And so this addresses things like how close to the to the site can there be, uh, you know, houses built, um, restrictions on use of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and microwave ovens um, in the communities around uh, around the observatory. Um, and then, of course, on site, we, we have our own strict rules about this. No, no cell phones permitted. They have to actually be off, not just in airplane mode. The computers that we use there day to day are contained inside shielded boxes. And we use monitors that have been um, you know, tested or and or modified to, to make sure they, they emit as little as possible. The entire building itself is is shielded. And so it's the the, the more shielding basically the, the 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 better. And so even within the shielded building, you have computers within shielded boxes and such. And, and at our at our site, we actually can't have microwave ovens in the kitchen. We have a whole bunch of toaster ovens um, for, for our lunch. So I'll, I'll wrap up there just to say that uh, radio astronomy is cool. There are many exciting discoveries, I think, yet to be made. And we're sort of in a, my, my mentor, Tom Landecker, likes to say we're in a radio technology arms race with communication. So there's more and more RFI because of technological developments, but some of those same technologies are also helping us to, to deal with that. And so it's sort of a, right. sort of a balance there. Um, and I will also say that there is a, another tour of the DRAO site coming up on March 11th. So I think we have this poster about it that I think NASA is going to send around um, to, to advertise that so you can sign up. And if you have any questions at any point, I'm happy to chat over email. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time and your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Anna Lamadog, for coming. And uh, I guess now we can uh, have a little, have some food together, or if you need to leave, you can leave. And if you want to ask questions, she's going to be here, which is yep. great. And uh, yeah, please, if you want to do the tour, you could ask her about that. And uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.